Good morning, Good Shepherd, and welcome to church this morning. My name is David Gunger. I'm one of the pastors here. Let's take a moment to center our hearts and minds on Christ. We do this by focusing on our breath. We take a big, deep breath in together. And we exhale about twice as long. God has brought you here, so pour out your heart. It'll be filled with the peace and wonder of Christ this morning. Together, let us read this call to worship. I'll lead us in this call to worship. You can follow along on the screen. Life can seem shrouded in mystery. O Lord, lift the veil of misunderstanding that we may see your light. We are eager to serve. O Lord, calm our spirits and patiently prepare us for service. Look to the Lord for mercy and for comfort. We look to the Lord for healing and for hope. Amen. Let us sing together this morning. One. And I 
And now a reading from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord! How good it is to sing praises to our God! How pleasant and fitting to praise Him! The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the power of human legs. The Lord delights in those who fear him who put their hope in his unfailing love. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, will be forevermore. Amen. time of my confession, in the hour of my deepest deed, when the pool of tears beneath my feet flood every newborn seed, there's a dying voice within me reaching out somewhere, toiling in the danger and in the morals of despair. Don't have the inclination to look back on any mistake Like Cain, I now behold this chain of events that I must break In the fury of the moment, I can see the Master's hand In every leaf that trembles, and in every grain of sand Flowers of indulgence and the weeds of yesteryear. Like criminals, they choke the breath of conscious and cheer. The Sunday down upon the steps of time to light the way, to ease the pain of idleness and the memory of decay. Gaze into the doorways of temptation's angry flame, and every 
time I pass the way I always hear my name Then onward in my journey I've come to understand That every hair is numbered Like every grain of sand I have gone from rags to riches In the sorrow of the night In the violence of a summer street In the chill of a wintry light In the bitter dance of loneliness Fading into space In the broken mirror of innocence On each forgotten face I hear the ancient footsteps Like the motion of the sea Sometimes I turn the sunday Of the times it's only me I am hanging in the balance of The reality of man Like every spell falling Like every grain All are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class, gender nor sexuality, politics nor religion, personality nor nationality, count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child.
Will you please join me in our generosity liturgy? Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our church. Amen. And now it's that moment when we invite you to share an ancient blessing with one another. If you're not in person, you can send a text message or an email or a silent prayer naming a name and sending that wonderful greeting, grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. Good morning once again. Welcome to Good Shepherd New York. My name is Michael Redzina, and I'm one of the pastors here. Today our gospel reading on this Dr. King weekend is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 3, and it's the story of Jesus' baptism on the second Sunday of Epiphany. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness in this way. And then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, before I offer my reflections on this text, I'd like to invite us into that little moment of quiet where whatever we bring into this, whether it's lots of faith or doubt, whatever thoughts or feelings we bring into this experience, we simply acknowledge them, check in with them, and we become present to them and to this story. And our hope is that somehow God could use this story to connect with ours in a meaningful way. And so I invite you into this moment of quiet to open your heart. God, we pray that you'd build a powerful bridge from this story in the Gospel of Matthew to our world and to this weekend where we remember Dr. King and what he meant for us and to us as a country and as a people. We pray for your guidance, for courage, and for inspiration. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today is... MLK weekend, and it is a time for us to celebrate, and it's a time for us to consider more deeply the life and the legacy of Dr. King. But today is also the second Sunday of Epiphany, which is also a focus on the baptism of Jesus, and it is likewise a time to consider the power of that ritual, this sacrament of water and initiation for our lives and for our world. And there's a rich connection between this legacy that Jesus leaves behind in baptism and the legacy that Dr. King leaves behind with this idea of beloved community. Perhaps what baptism and beloved community have in common is that they both evolve. You know, baptism did not originate with Jesus. And beloved community as an idea did not originate with Dr. King. They are both interpreted and reinterpreted both by Jesus and Dr. King in ways that leave indelible and climactic 
marks on each of them respectively. And while they each bring baptism and beloved community to a sort of climax, it is true that those that they left behind after their death so quickly abandoned the meaning they established. And they each worked so hard to establish that meaning. And so we're left with this irony in the wake of Jesus' death and in the wake of Dr. King's death of a people grappling, wrestling with what they meant, with what they did, and with how we can be influenced and changed by it. And so we have these days, these seasons, where we keep coming back to these ideas and to these stories so that we can try to rediscover them in ways that are fresh and meaningful for us today, so that you and I can ask the simple question, are we being faithful to this notion of baptism which Jesus left? And are we being faithful to this idea of beloved community which Dr. King left behind? So let's, let's get into it. What did Jesus do with baptism? And what did Dr. King do with this idea of beloved community? And how are these connected for us as a church community in this so-called year of the neighbor? Well, first of all, let's explore Jesus' baptism. Here we have this idea of the beloved. You are my beloved in whom I find great pleasure. This is the mystical, it's the audiovisual message that Jesus receives in the core of his being. It's a primal mystical encounter that Jesus has in the waters of John's baptism. Now, in this story, the heavens break open and the dove of peace descends. You have this reassuring voice from heaven which rings out in Jesus' ears. What Jesus experienced here defines him. It sets into motion the tone of the rest of his life. It is his foundational spiritual experience that sort of results in a lifestyle which to this day continues to both mesmerize and scandalize us. We are at the same time wooed and invited by Jesus' life, and we're also challenged beyond what we assume is possible. We have to note the bookends here in Jesus' story with baptism. The very first bookend is Jesus' baptism himself. How do we make sense of this event? And Jesus, as we said, didn't invent it. He received it from John, and contrary to what you might think, John didn't invent this either, right? They both inherited this ritual of baptism, and they both reinterpreted it in powerful ways. So let's begin with John. And to get him, we have to sort of zoom out and get the time in which he lived. There was this desire, a strong desire, in the face of chaos for some order and for some coherence. And what Greek and Roman dominance offered was that coherence and that order. It came, though, at a cost which I think was perceived over time to be too much. What was so expensive about this order that both Greece and Rome provided the people? Well, the cost was, in exchange for security and in exchange for order, what they lost was their own cultural identity in many cases, and they lost power. There was a chaos, order, chaos, order kind of pendulum swing that has continued to persist through history. And this is the pendulum swing that we even taste today as we face the chaos of our world, this chaos of unpredictability and this chaos of change. And I think this has led to tendencies we see today in our world toward totalitarian leadership, which seems to be emerging all over Western culture. Nationalistic leanings, which both offer the leadership and the nationalistic sort of group orientation. They both offer order and they offer a sense of clarity and a sense of rootedness in the face of chaos and change and in unpredictability. Now in John's time, the pendulum was swinging once again. The order of Hellenism, which was the dominance of the Greeks, 
and the order of Rome, which was the dominance of uh, Roman power, it left these smaller communities, these regional communities, reeling. And within the Jewish community specifically, there were these like bubbling renewal movements that kept popping up. And these renewal movements were also resistance movements. They were trying to help the people get their identity back. They were trying to challenge the empire in meaningful ways. And more important, they were trying to be faithful to who they really were. John led one of these resistance movements, one of these renewal movements. And washings up to this time had been a key part of resistance and renewal. It was uh, signified a sort of need for cleansing. It was uh, communicating this need for a purification from the corrupting forces of either Greek or Roman and or Roman dominance. It was an awareness that was building among the people of an impending judgment on the state of affairs. And there was this sense of invitation and this urgency toward transformation. And John keeps that emphasis with his baptism, but he also innovates, which is kind of exciting. For John, his baptisms, um, uh, or sorry, before John, baptisms were repeated often, frequent, sometimes even daily rituals. And they were also DIY, the kind of thing that you could do on your own. They didn't require help or guidance or the expertise or the sort of mediating force of another. They were also private and individualized. So John sort of changes all of that. And he knows that to wield a substantial resistance movement in the face of Roman power and corruption, that baptism has to be something that's corporate, not just individual. It needs to be something that is public, not just private. It needs to be received, not just a DIY project. And it is powerful stuff. I mean, when John enacts this new interpretation of baptism, the crowds flock, the momentum starts to shift, there's a popularity that begins to soar. And John embodies this. And then Jesus comes along and he further reinterprets this ritual. In Matthew's story, Jesus comes to the Jordan River where John has selectively chosen uh, to participate and enact this ritual of baptism, of cleansing. But Jesus reinterprets it. When Jesus experiences this, he experiences not the burning sense of justice and judgment, which John brings to the ritual, but he experienced this, this primal thing of love, divine love, in the core of his being. And it is a, a love which guides the rest of his life. That's one bookend. We get a sense of how Jesus changes John's ritual or reinterprets it by these bookends. Here, he hears the voice of the beloved saying, you're my beloved and you I find great pleasure. And then at the very end of his life, after all is said and done, after his death and resurrection, he sends his disciples out. And as he sends them out, he says, go and baptize. But he doesn't call them to baptize their own. He doesn't call, tell them to baptize a chosen group. Uh, an in-group. He doesn't use baptism as a way to solidify group identity. He uses baptism as a portal to transcend group identity. And he tells them to baptize all ethne, all nations. For Jesus, this sort of tribal ritual of purity, which usually resulted in separation and distinction, has been transformed into a ritual that marks out this radical inclusion and solidarity with every human being, with every people group, with every tribe and tongue and nation. Jesus takes John's baptism, which has already been reinterpreted, and reinterprets it further. And one of the things that Jesus leaves behind at the end of this bookend is that this universal baptism, which is meant for all, is to be extended in his name. Now, what's in a name? Why would Jesus say baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or why would some of the earliest disciples or apostles sometimes just baptize people in the name of Jesus? It's because 
the name brings to mind the way of life and what that life represents. And when we look to Jesus, sorry, when we look to Jesus' life, what do we see? We see Jesus moving away from John's purity mindset and purity culture that creates an exclusive tribe of people who are following the right codes and rituals. It instead starts to expand the sense of love. This baptism, baptismal love which Jesus experiences in his own life, in his own heart, begins to get enacted. Yet all the, all the forces of Greece and of Rome were to create hierarchies and order, and they accomplished that. But what they did is they started to assign value based on things other than human dignity. And so there was this, for everyone in the empire, either inflated sense of dignity or deflated sense of dignity. And what Jesus knew and experienced in his baptism is that he, as a Galilean peasant, born to a poor family on the outskirts of the empire, that he was the beloved, and that in him there was a source of great pleasure for God. And it was that sense of self, that sense of worth, that sense of esteem that led him not just to uh, enjoy it himself, but to fight for it on behalf of everyone else who didn't have it. This also meant that those who had the inflated sense of status or the inflated sense of worth because of the metrics of Greece and Rome, that they also would be rehumanized. Because what he saw the empires doing is in inflating some values or in identities and in deflating others, that we're all being dehumanized. Whether we're the oppressor or the one being oppressed, in each case, something is lost in our humanity. And Jesus fights his entire life to restore humanity to individuals and then to restore individuals to each other in community. And this is the bridge to Dr. King's concept of the beloved community. What Dr. King does with the beloved community is he takes Jesus' life and he tries to articulate what that would mean for us today. He, like us today, observed Jesus expanding the table, expanding the sense of us, moving away from exclusive, tribalistic, sort of chosen people uh, thinking to seeing the entire human race whom God created and loved as chosen, as destined for glory, and therefore worthy of inclusion. And it also, this idea of beloved community becomes the source, the sort of moral uh, ideal by which all things that get in the way of that ideal are judged. Jesus resisted Rome, resisted the sort of Greco-Roman power structures and exclusive instincts that sort of bled their way into the Jewish imagination. And Jesus did this in a way that didn't dehumanize and it didn't um, uh, dissolve the personhood of his opponent. He resists evil without reducing his opponent or dehumanizing his opponent. And this is the thing that Dr. King was genius at with his idea of beloved community through nonviolent love. He was able to resist and name evil, but to call out the humanity of his enemy, to call out the humanity of his oppressor, and to inflate those who had been deflated by the powers and the structures that were corrupt and unjust. Now, Dr. King, like Jesus, didn't invent the thing he's remembered for most. He didn't invent this idea of beloved community. That was Josiah Royce. Royce was a, a disciple, an American disciple, of the philosopher Hegel. And in J Royce's thinking, this idea of beloved community was rooted in a notion of loyalty and solidarity with all humanity. And Royce also distilled this from uh, Paul's teachings and the teachings of Christianity. And he, like Dr. King, saw that the Christian church had gravitated or shifted far away from its calling, far from its origins in the life of Jesus. That the church itself had taken on these imperial mindsets and practices 
that the church itself had become just as violent and just as exclusive as the thing Jesus named and opposed and resisted. And so it needed transformation. But what Dr. King does in developing this is he expounds and expands or adds this idea of agape. And he notes that in the Christian tradition, agape is one of those thematic trends that's undeniable. The kind of trend that if you were to take that theme out, it would be unrecognizable to itself. And unfortunately, what Dr. King saw in the uh, American South specifically and in the United States was a Christianity that had been robbed of this practice of agape. Agape is translated love. It's one of the many words that are translated love in the New Testament. And for Dr. King, this agape love is something that's free and it's spontaneous. It is a gift. It is something that is given without expectation for return or without self-interest. And in this way, it's different than erotic love, which is beautiful in its own right. It's different than phileo love, which is the kind of interest of friendship. But it is a divine love. It's not the kind of love that we can drum up within ourselves. It is an overflowing love that comes from the kind of experience Jesus had at his baptism. The sense of being filled with divine pleasure and divine love. And then letting that pour out to our neighbor, even to our enemy. And so Dr. King took this notion of beloved community and expanded and developed it for the challenge of the civil rights era. Now today, I want us to consider the ways in which Jesus' practice of baptism and Dr. King's idea of beloved community, they help us in this year of the neighbor. I think one of the ways that, that both of them help us is in baptism, we're encouraged as a community to remember that we don't look to status the way that everyone else looks at status. We've been groomed to think of status. I mean, even this last week, I saw a couple of celebrities walking through the city and I quickly pulled out my phone and took a picture and sent them to my friends because there's still something that's groomed in me to assign value to some over others based on the metrics of our culture, especially in our culture, the metrics of celebrity and fame. And what Jesus is challenging us to do is to learn to see ourselves in the other, to learn to see value and dignity in all people alike, to be able to, in the random encounter we have at the bodega or the encounter we have with our colleague at work or those conversations that we have with our children or even the people who are annoying to us, that we can learn to see the human humanity in them and to see them as the beloved of God, as Jesus experienced in his baptism. In some ways, that's what baptism's about. You know, baptism was an exclusive, purity-oriented thing that demarcated the chosen from the outsider. It was an exclusive practice of initiation, and Jesus changes all that. Jesus transforms baptism as a portal to inclusive love, and he models this with his own table. And in Christian worship, that's why the water or the bath and the table are our primary sacraments, because they both signal the sort of initiation into inclusive love and then that regular practice of inclusive love through an open table that shape and define us as followers of Jesus. And I think Dr. King's legacy, likewise, is extended into the world as we embrace his vision to enlarge the sense of us, to not be um, uh, comfortable and content with just being loyal to our family and friends, which is what we all do. And Dr. King says, this is good, but it becomes divine when we learn to stretch beyond our family and friends, when we learn to stretch beyond those exchanges of self-interest, which really make this city tick. And we begin to enact a countercultural way of love. And so on this weekend, I challenge us to think, what does it mean to be faithful to our baptism, right? To be set apart as inclusive lovers, not only of God, but of our neighbor. And what does it look like to enact that love through this notion of beloved community, of stretching the idea of us, of making sure that our sense of us isn't, doesn't have a line around it of family, of kinship, 
of tribe, of likeness, but it really does stretch to the ends of all humanity. May God give us the power to move and to lean and to embody this love. Amen. And now that we have reflected on our gospel, we declare our faith. This is the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me in this? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we have declared our faith, we offer our prayers. These are the prayers of the people. And now join us in the prayers of the people. Gracious God, as we are early in this new year, we pray for our hearts and our spirits to be renewed and refreshed. God who is with us, draw near to us now, to the lonely, to the overwhelmed, to the joyful, the tired, the delighted, the happy and the brokenhearted. Though we are scattered wide across this globe, we are together in your spirit. Make your presence known to each of us, and may we collectively turn our hearts toward you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we are weary with bad news. The headlines that we face daily can be so overwhelming. Let us turn away from divisiveness and taking sides and be open to one another as your beloved children. We pray against hate, racism, xenophobia, and unhospitable hearts. We are sick from living in a world characterized by such sins. Grant us an imagination for a better, more loving, and just world, and embolden us with the courage to create it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, we lift up those who are suffering. Give us hearts to see them among us and the will to sit with and serve them. We pray for those in our city who are experiencing homelessness. May they feel seen and cared for this week. We pray for the poor and low income, that you would grant rest and hope. For the lonely, grant community. For the depressed and the anxious, comfort. For the overworked and burnt out, give respite. For all who long for justice, renew that vision afresh this week and strengthen them to do your work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now for all who are dying and all who have died, that they may rest in peace. We pray for the souls of all those lost to the pandemic, and we pray for their loved ones. May you comfort them in their grief. We thank you for their lives and we honor their memories. Lord, we are your church, your body on this earth, broken and battered though we may be. And we pray for unity, for love, for devotion to one another and you. Work through us, God, as instruments of peace, reconciliation, healing, and joy in New York and beyond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now that we've offered our prayers, we take a moment to confess our sins. This moment of corporate confession is begun with our own introspection as Jesus invited us to consider the log in our own eyes rather than obsessing with the little speck in our neighbors. So we together make that kind of space for introspection. Only this isn't a cosmic beatdown and it's not morbid in its tone, but rather it is a joyful 
if not sober, look at our lives in the context of God's love and kindness. It's not uh, impending judgment or the fear of shame or the uh, prick of guilt that sustains this kind of Christian self-reflection, but it's the grace that we find in Jesus Christ. It's that inclusive love that's always with us, as Jesus said, that makes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. It's that kindness that leads to real change. And so in that context, we are invited into holy memory, thinking about the week behind us and asking the question, what has been done or left undone that goes against the love that we see in Jesus Christ, that cuts against its grain? And so we invite you into that quiet moment right now. Whatever memory is coming to your mind and heart, hold it there tenderly and confident in the love of God and ask for God's help for new power and imagination to overcome that which holds you back from love. And with all of us being freshly connected to our own sin, we join together in a corporate confession of sin. Would you join me in this? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now that we've made our confession, we hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. We are loved, we are forgiven, and we are included in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now that we've made our confession, we come to the meal that Jesus gave us, what we call Holy Communion, and we begin with an ancient prayer of gratitude. Would you join me in this? The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is a good and joyful thing to say thank you. And right now as a community, we pause and we say thank you for all of the good gifts of our lives. We especially thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, the center and cornerstone of our faith, the one sent into the world to reveal that God is love, the one who shows us how that love is expressed and embodied through the incarnation, through the many teachings, through his table, through his healings, through his miracles, and through his great love. In his death, we see the extent of the divine love in our world. And at the resurrection, we see the triumph of this world, of this love. And so with this in mind, we lift our hearts in gratitude and praise, joining the voices of angels and archangels of Isaiah's vision when they cry out, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that these gifts of bread and cup would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this body, which is broken and given. We pray that we would receive this love in our hearts afresh, and that having been filled afresh with this love, we would in turn offer our lives, ourselves, our bodies, broken and given for the sake of our neighbor. Amen. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, 
This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which speaks a better word than our violence and then our instinct to revenge. And instead, we are drawn into the reconciling and forgiving love of our Creator. We pray that you'd fill us with the power to do so as we partake of this cup. Amen. And now we declare the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Amen. Well, at this time, we invite you to receive Holy Communion. Our practice is an open table, which means any drawn to the love that you find in Christ are welcome to receive the bread and the cup. If you have bread and cup with you, at this time, we invite you to take the bread and dip it in the cup and simply say thanks be to God. Let us receive Holy Communion together. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you so much for joining us at Good Shepherd New York once again online. Uh, we're grateful for uh, your engagement and for your presence and also for your support. Thank you to all, all of you who have given to, uh, not only to our operating budget, but also to our Christmas offering, uh, which is helping to support Digital Church in this new year. Our goal for a digital church this next year through a Christmas offering was $200,000. And right now we're at about $127,000. Uh, so we're moving well toward our mark. Our Christmas offering is open through January and we encourage you to give as you're able. Uh, some of you can give more. Uh, some of you may only be able to give a little bit. But what we're, we're looking for is participation because we really do wanna see not only our digital ministry continue and sustain, but we want it to be enriched and to grow. Um, with your help and meeting the goal, we'll be able to not only continue what we've been doing in the past, but we'll be able to add new layers of support, not only for our own production, um, making it a little bit um, more sustainable for us, but also to enrich and further your engagement uh, with us as a community. Um, this is through digital groups and expanding those, this is through uh, converting other experiences that we have here in New York into digital experiences. And then it also means hopefully hosting a retreat in the fall where we can convene together and get to know one another and put flesh and blood to the sort of numbers or the names that we see across a screen or via email or letters. And so it's an exciting year and exciting possibilities. And as we said before, we will do as much as we can with whatever we receive. And we want to keep you informed on where we are. So if you can make a gift to the Christmas offering, you can text Good Shepherd NY to 77977. And in the drop down menu, you can select Christmas offering. And now let's receive our benediction. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. Now receive this benediction. People of hope and peace go into the world, bringing God's healing love to all whom you meet. Help with ministries which promote justice and compassion. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. And now let us sing our doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace.
way are you going? And which side will you be on? Will you stand and watch while all the seeds of hate are sown? Will you stand with those who say, let God's will be done? One hand on the Bible and one hand on the gun. One hand on the Bible and one hand on the gun. Which way are you looking? Is it hard? Say what's wrong for her is now wrong for me. Lines have changed, we've rearranged. What have we become? All our olive branches turn to spears when our flowers turn to guns. All our olive branches turn to spears When our flowers turn to guns Then we crucify 